Hi, everybody, and welcome to ASLAB 80. I'm Rafael Chevier, a researcher and PhD student at Azulaj Research Network, which is part of ARTIS, the Institute of Art History and of the University of Lisbon. On behalf of my research group and National Azulaj Museum, the organizers of the ASLAB lecture series, I'll be hosting this session. And today we have a very special guest, Somian Bandiopadai. Somian is the Sir James Sterling Chair in Architecture and former head of the Liverpool School of Architecture. He directs the Research Center Archive, an interdisciplinary forum with research and implementation projects in Oman, Qatar, Morocco and India. His teaching and research interests are focused on the historical, theoretical and contextual approaches to architectural design and the architecture and settlements of India and the Middle East, but also has undertaken advisor and consultancy work in urban development, heritage management, and reuse of several Omani Oasis settlements. Author of several published works in scientific journals, is now currently working on a monograph on Moscat, entitled Cosmopolitan Moscat, Omani Architecture of a Globalizing Port City. So, without further ado, please, Somian, feel free to start. The screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to uh, talk about this uh, particular uh, aspect of the Omani Mihrab and the uh, ceramic inserts, uh, which I will talk about. And obviously, uh, then it'll be good to have some questions from your end, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, when I complete. If I can provide, a st a start with a kind of brief overview of, you know, where Oman is and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the geographical condition so that you are aware of it, because I'm sure that not many would be uh, aware of the geographical context of Oman. Oman is in the southeastern corner of the Arabian Peninsula, where, uh, we have um, uh, the Iran at the north end of it, Saudi Arabia, obviously over here, and Yemen, and UAE, which used to be known as Trucial Oman, as part of uh, uh, it, uh, as part of uh, a wider, it belonged to a part of a wider uh, Omani cultural horizon, and that uh, is uh, just to the north and west. Um, so. And the part that I'm going to talk about is really mainly the central zone, what is called the kind of heartland of Oman, which is the zone around the Gulf of Oman and uh, also structured by the mountains, the Oman mountains, which run through and effectively kind of get into the sea on one end. And uh, on the other end, it actually also gets into the sea near Musandam, the Hormuz, uh, Strait of Hormuz. So, the mountain range actually structures the settlements and uh, the, the nature of Omani uh, culture in a big way. So I've just got a section here which will show the, the different parts of it. So for example, that uh, if you take a section through the mountains here, the, uh, the coastal strip, which is called the Batana Coastal Strip is a really, really narrow one. And so a settlement here like Mosna is over there. And then it actually uh, gradually rises up into the hills where we have a number of older settlements going back to uh, about the, uh, many of these settlements are from the pre-Islamic times and these older settlements are located here. But mainly the, most of the older settlements are located on the other side of the mountains, which is around the zone, I would say between three and four, you know, this kind of purple zone where many of the older settlements are located. So uh, settlements like Nizwa, Izki, Bahala, and so on, they're located on this side. And, uh, but also on the mountains up here, there are other settlements which uh, have been um, there, um, you know, these are isolated small little settlements which uh, have been uh, there for a long time as well. So. Many of these settlements are ancient settlements. Most of it goes back to the, certainly to the pre-Islamic times. And uh, many of the 
uh, origins of these settlements can be dated back to even prehistoric times for sure. Now, the OSS settlements that I'm going to talk about, uh, which are the ones on the inner foothill side of things, and I might just go back very quickly just to look at. So I will mainly focus on settlements on the inner foothill side where many of these mosques have been found and many of the decorated mihrabs have been found. So I'm going to talk about those uh, primarily. Uh, so these settlements are oasis settlements, which means that they rely on an uh, 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 artificial agricultural system, an irrigation system, which is uh, supported by what is called the, the Falaj irrigation system. The Falaj irrigation system is similar to uh, the system that we find in uh, Iran, which is known as Kanath uh, system, as well as in many of the other arid regions. However, uh, often it was thought until very recently that uh, the Falaj system was actually a derivative of the uh, Kanath system. That is that you know, the, the water system was brought in by the Iranians into Arabian Peninsula. However, more recent archaeological work has clearly determined that both from Oman as well as from B, that certainly some of the Falaz systems, the earlier Falaz systems go back to about 1000 BC, and that certainly predates any kind of Persian influence in that region. So therefore, it is very clear that, and very probably, probable that it is a uh, 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 an indigenous system that has grown up and then may have actually taken uh, influences from Persia at a later time. What it does is that there are three types of water um, systems. One is called uh, uh, the, uh, the one that relies on aquifers is called the Dawoodi Palad system and which taps into an aquifer through a mother well. And then there is a channel that actually brings the water out to uh, the, the oasis sites. And as the ground actually uh, gradually recedes, you have the channel surfacing. But there are several of these uh, uh, wells which are connected, dug so that they can actually bring out the spoils like these ones over here on the right hand side, which then create the ventilation system for the, uh, the plant system as well as allows the spoils to be brought out. And then you have normally this kind of embankment, which then holds the, the, any kind of debris from falling back. Now, the other system that is there, which is called the Aini Fala system, or the one that is based on springs. And that is something that, uh, again, uses the, the same kind of channel system, but on the other hand, it actually taps water from sources which are uh, natural springs. And the third type of system is that there are the wadi, the dry wadi beds, which are the drainage systems, the natural drainage system, from where there is often in certain water systems, there are sur surplus water that is present on the surface, and that is then tapped into. So these are the three systems, the uh, Daudi system, the Aini system, and the uh, the uh, the uh, the Gaili system, which is the, the one based on uh, uh, your surface water flow. So these systems of uh, irrigation then create a very complex oasis structure. For example, this one that I show here is uh, from Barkat al Maus, which is in central Oman again, along those the same foothill region that I was talking about. And you can see that in that sort of the blue line that I can actually, I trace here, that the dotted line here is really about the, the underground part of the channel that comes into a settlement. And then the settlement, as it comes towards the settlement, the point where it surfaces is where the water is collected for drinking purposes. And then the water is then used for agricultural purposes and washing and other things across the settlement. And these, Colored parts, the A, B, and C are the three key settlement areas where the human habitation, concentration of human habitation occurs. And uh, these are the kind of settlements where, which uh, have the other civic facilities like mosques and you know, madrasas or schools, uh, Quranic schools and so on 
in those areas. So those are the kind of settlement areas, the human habitation areas, and the rest are the agricultural lands that are then protected by elaborate defensive systems and so on and so forth. So that is something that has been happening for a long time. Uh, and it's very important to understand that many, most of the OSS system, uh, building or OSS settlements are reliant on this kind of a water irrigation system, which therefore provides the kind of lifeline for these settlements to exist and the civic presences to exist. And this particular example is a, actually, a, in a way, a revival of the irrigation system in the 16th and 17th centuries, mainly 17th century, whereby major investments were made into land and into agriculture. And you can see that sort of very elaborate systems like aqueducts, you know, which were constructed at that time, which takes the water across, as you can see here in that line, blue line here, uh, which takes the water across the, the entire oasis. So these are complex and uh, important systems, but they are really important to understand because they provide the lifeline for these settlements to exist. Now, looking into the Omani uh, mosques, uh, I should probably say a few words about the particular sect of Islam that operates in Oman. Uh, we normally think about you know, the Shia and the Sunni uh, sects, uh, but uh, Oman has uh, the sect called Ibadi sect. Now the Ibadis are also present to an extent in North Africa, and especially in uh, Tunisia, uh, Algeria, and uh, but mainly in Oman. They come out of the same uh, Kharijite schism that took place uh, at the very early stages, which split uh, uh, Islam into Shia and Sunni factions. But it's, it comes out at the same time, uh, but it has some interesting, important differences between uh, with the other uh, religious sects. So for example, that uh, Ibadism is, does not believe in uh, 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 kind of uh, the, the primacy of the prophet's family. It does not believe that the prophet's family has a particular privilege in terms of having uh, uh, a kind of uh, privileged uh, position within the religion. It also acknowledges the first two uh, calif caliphs, but after that, it does not recognize the rest of the caliphate. And so therefore uh, there are some important differences here. It is also a very, uh, what would, one would call a kind of more democratic system of uh, imamate because the imam, uh, the imamate uh, did not, uh, because of its non-reliance on particular important families that it was in theory at least, you know, open to the various sects uh, and the various uh, groups who could equally have a presence and a prominence within that. So an imam could come from any walk of life within uh, the Omani culture and society. And that I think is a very important thing about uh, the Ibadi sect. And the Ibadis are also a very moderate sect. And one of the key things, therefore the question arises that, and the moderate sect also then becomes expressed through a very moderate kind of architecture, a simple kind of architecture. Hence a question that, you know, these decorative mehrabs that I will, I will talk about, you know, why did they come about? How did they actually establish themselves in the kind of context where, you know, essentially the architecture is a very simple one. Now, one particular thing about the Omani mosque, therefore, one has to uh, look at is that uh, I will just briefly talk about the form of the mosque because these are kind of interesting uh, influences that actually talk about uh, Oman's situation within the Indian Ocean region, but also in the Arabian Peninsula, and what kind of connections that was uh, taking place there. So the mosque, as you can see in this axonometric drawing, is essentially like a closed box. Unlike the mosques of Central uh, Arabia, which are the Liwan type, where you have arcades in the front, and you enter the mosque frontally or directly, uh, and then you uh, come up to the mehra in a direct way, uh, sort of accessing it frontally. However, 
in the Omani mosques, as you can see here, that they're essentially a kind of closed box. And one of the kind of theories that, uh, you know, following some of the research that has been taking place, um, one can say with some degree of certainty that this particular notion actually comes from uh, uh, Yemen and a kind of South Arabian type of mosque, which is not the same as the North Arabian and Central Arabian uh, type of mosque that we see. Other thing that happens with the, the, the mosque is that you normally enter it, uh, not necessarily always frontally, but also from the side. And sometimes the side gets quite a significant precedence. So what effectively happens is that a main courtyard, um, you know, which adjoins the mosque. So the mosque prayer hall is here. The, the, there is a, a courtyard or a barra or a shan, which is next to it. And then you have a washing ablution area or called wudu in the corner. So the relationship between the shan, the, the, uh, the outside courtyard or terrace, and the inside of the mosque is a lateral one. So rather than a frontal one, you see here that there is a frontal one, but the lateral one takes precedence and prominence. And that you will see in many, many Omani mosques. So essentially what you're doing is entering the courtyard and then turning, entering the mosque and then turning towards the mirror, you know, which is uh, really something uh, quite interesting and unique in many of the Omani uh, mosques. So what you find is that relationship. But also another thing that happens here uh, is this insertion of what you call a boomer or uh, a small little domical structure in the north, normally in the northeast corner of the mosque, but not always in the northeast corner of the mosque, which is called the boomer. Now the boomer is analogous to the minaret, but it Omani Ibadi Omani mosques never had minarets, so it is. Not so much that uh, while coastal mosques, which mainly adhere to Sunni um, uh, religious uh, sects, but also some Shi'i sects, they have minarets, but the Omani mosques of Central Oman, uh, the Ibadi mosques of Central Oman do not have minarets. Instead, they have always had a Buma. Now, the word Buma has got a strong connection with uh, the South Ara uh, ancient Arabian and Semitic roots, which I'll, I'll mention in a moment as well. So the key features of the mosque is therefore that the mosque differs from those found in the Gulf region. Those are, these are closed boxes, as I was saying, or cuboids uh, uh, with smaller openings, not large openings or arcades. And many of the mosques are entered from the side, as I described. And this is a unique uh, mosque form to the interior of Oman, not to the coast, as I mentioned, and has connections with Hadramaut and Yemen. And also they are, have links with the forms of old South Arabian places of worship, which were essentially the kind of boxes that uh, I was describing. And the other thing that, which is very distinctive about uh, the mosque is the Buma, where the mosque, uh, the Buma is analogous to the minaret, but not quite that and the Buma has got a Semitic and a South Arabian root, which I'll talk in a moment. Another feature I think I should point out on the plan here about the mosque uh, Mihrab is that the prayer niche, the Mihrab, is unlike many of the other Sunni mosques, not deep. It's a very shallow one built into the wall. The reason being that the Ibadi sect believed that the Imam or the preacher was not distinct dissociated from the congregation. He did not have an exalted position or a special position related to the congregation, and therefore he should not have a separate position. So therefore the Imam's role or the preacher's role or the, the one who would read out the sermon and call for the prayer would be part of the congregation rather than separate from the congregation. And therefore this shallow niche did not allow somebody to stand inside the mera, as you'd have in our, many other cases within the Sunni mosque. And therefore, it would be a very important distinction in the Ibadi uh, mehrabs. So as I was talking about that, if you look into the South Arabian, uh, sorry, the, the Sunni examples, like this is an example from uh, the Muscat region. 
and there are plenty of other examples uh, where you have a minaret. This is a kind of a Baluchi Sunni mosque where a very elaborate minaret is, is present. Also, you can see that in the case of this particular example from Bahrain, where an elaborate min uh, minaret is present, uh, a prominent minaret is present, and you can see the kind of very arcaded kind of approach to you know, the, the building. Whereas if you look into some of the early South Arabian you know, models, this is a pre-Islamic South Arabian model of a uh, uh, temple, uh, where you find the kind of the solidified, this very solid cuboidal form is prominent and given prominence by, you know, in this particular small little model. And the same thing you can see as you look into mosques in, um, in Yemen. Uh, this is, these are small mosques in Sana'a area that you find the same kind of idea of the box, the box and the kind of lateral entry and so on being preserved in many, many ways. So, in this case, the box is here. Uh, this is a particularly little, small little tomb, which is connected to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the mosque. But nevertheless, the lateral entry is there. Same lateral entry is here for uh, another small mosque. Again, a small tomb is attached to it. But you turn to, towards the mehrab. Same thing you do here. And the same thing is happening here. But at the same time, there is, of course, a frontal uh, uh, sort of uh, terrace out here as well. Here I uh, showed the example of uh, the Omani um, uh, the mosque as well. So the other thing that I was talking about is the Buma, the presence of the Buma, which is uh, a kind of a small domical appendage, uh, normally on the northeast corner of the, the mosque, but not always. You can see the cubital form and you can see the kind of small domical structure. The domical structure was used uh, with an internal rung ladder, you know, which would actually come up just behind this uh, corner to allow the muazzin or the, the person who will call for prayers to go up to the roof to uh, sort of announce the time of prayer. But so there are two particular words that I think uh, the Buma connotes. One is uh, an owl, the idea of an owl, which is silhouetted against the sky. So a very still form of an owl as a bird, you know, which is very still and stays still for a long time. And that is an uh, you know, herb meaning of it. However, the other meaning that has uh, quite an important uh, presence in this particular context is the, the Hebrew word Bama, uh, which is directly connected to this particular uh, etymology of this particular word, uh, Buma. Uh, the Bama is a sacred high place you know, where particular rituals will take place. And I think if you look into some of the pre-Islamic coins from Bostra area in, uh, in, the, in the Palestine region, you'll find that a kind of representation of a sort of Bama, where you have steps or ladders going up to a high place, a sacred place, a, a high raised place, where you have a kind of a domical structure present. You see the same thing in many other uh, coins which were minted in that kind of region uh, around the Israel, Negev, uh, uh, Palestine region. And you'll find these kind of references to the Buma, which are also, interestingly, uh, the word used for pre-Islamic tombs, which were found in Oman, which are found in Oman, uh, on hilltops. So these tombs, which took the shape of uh, a kind of you know, this sort of very similar shape to the, the one that I'm referring to here, they were also known as Boma sometimes. So the kind of relationship between uh, these sacred high places, also pre-Islamic tombs, which were located at high places and uh, mountain tops, which were sort of flat mountain uh, tops, and the connection between owls, which were also used in sepulchral um, situations, are a really interesting discussion that I have in my book on, uh, on the Omani uh, um, mosque and the kind of various elements of it. And I can talk about that in detail, but I, I just want to mention these things for now. Now, coming to the Omani decorated mihrab, uh, I will um, first of all highlight the kind of importance of the trade relationships that used to exist from very ancient times in the Indian Ocean region, especially in the Western Indian Ocean, 
over here, but also uh, also later on with the Eastern, Indi Eastern Indian Ocean region. So, for example, the uh, the trade links with China that eventually developed very strongly. And as you can see that the Chinese connections kind of then brought in a lot of material through the, you know, the, uh, the Strait of Malacca into the, around the southern Indian tip of the Indian Peninsula, and then to the various parts of, uh, whether it's Homus in, you know, the uh, southern edge of um, uh, Iran, or the various coastal, various coastal ports uh, along the Arabian Peninsula, as well as the East African uh, elements. So the, the range of connections that existed from pre-Islam uh, actually created exchange of people, exchange of uh, material, exchange of artifacts, exchange of uh, expertise as well. And that's something that I think we have to bear in mind as we talk about the the, the mehrabs and the insertion of the Chinese postal in both India. Now, uh, we will come back to that one in a moment. The first decorated mehrab that we see, and you can see as I was discussing previously, this is essentially a shallow mehrab built into the wall. There is not, there isn't a depth. So you wouldn't see in the wall uh, from outside, there is no projection in the wall. So the wall is essentially intact on the outside with no prominence or projection. And the entire uh, wall, uh, mirab is built into and decorated within the wall itself. Now, the early ones, the examples of mirabs and that you find commonly available are either a, a shallow niche, one niche, or a three niche, or a five niche, or a seven niche, okay? So, it is always those uh, numbers of one, three, five, seven, and so on that uh, create the niches. So you can see here the indication of three niches here, for example. And you know this is again a uh, similar kind of work of one, two, three niches you know, available here and so on. Now, these you find quite commonly without a decoration, these kind of shallow niches, receding niches, which are present in most of the Omani mosques. However, around 12, uh, in, in the middle of the 13th century, 1252, we find this particular mosque uh, in the, called the Masjid al Jama or the Friday Mosque in Sal, which is part of Nizua, one of the central Omani settlements, where we find this decorative mihrab coming up. So the decorative mihrab appears in a kind of complete state. So that is that the decoration is uh, fully present. There are sort of details which are, um, you know, sort of doesn't show any kind of state of evolution. And therefore it could be uh, assumed that this was done by uh, craftsmen who were brought in from other parts of the Arabian Peninsula or potentially from Iran or even from Egypt. So, Again, I will hark back to the kind of trade connection that used to exist. And let's also not forget, and I'll go back to the map you know, just for a moment, that around the same time, around the middle of the 13th century, the couple of important things about that period is that you know, we have the Mamluk uh, presence in Egypt and uh, also in the Northern Arabian region, but the Mamluk presence also supported and had a very strong connection with the Rasulid uh, sultans uh, of uh, of Yemen and of Hadramaut. So therefore the kind of strong presence here, which also created a small number of decorated mehrabs in uh, Sana and the Eden region, uh, but there are only a few. Whereas uh, what we find here is that a kind of appearance of the this decorated mehrab, the 1252 one, as a complete state. So our assumption at this moment is that it is either um, being influenced by Rasulid uh, work that was happening. And uh, the Rasulids also uh, were uh, bringing in quite a lot of artifacts, for example, funerary um, uh, stele from India, from the uh, Cambay area of Gujarat. And that kind of trade was bringing in quite a lot of de decorative and material influence from India to be part of the, uh, the Rasulid Empire. 
Now, it is possible that it had, could have come through, through from a kind of dominant Mabluk influence through a solid uh, you know, patronage, and then craftsmen were coming to, uh, to, to Oman. However, there is another possibility that I would like to uh, indicate here, and that is that you know, the Hormuz is at that time a prominent, uh, Hormuzi empire is a prominent empire, you know, which variously works under the Seljuks and the, you know, the, the various other sort of dominant uh, Islamic rulers and empires you know, within the kind of Islamic heartland. But Hormuz eventually develops a very strong presence across the Indian Ocean, so Hormuzi empire. The Hormuzi empire op operates from the sort of uh, the island of Hormuz, just off the coast. And uh, from there also they develop a strong presence within the hinterland of uh, Hormuz as well in the Iranian heartland. However, they also have a very strong presence in a place called Kalhat over here and in on, along the Omani coast and possibly the capital of Oman in Muscat now, which was possibly a Hormuzi uh, uh, enclave as well, ex exclave as well. So these areas, uh, that is Kalhat and uh, Muscat, they were part of the kind of Hormuzi empire. And the Hormuzi empire was drawing in influences from Iran, mainland Iran, and they were also drawing in influences from Africa and so on. So it is possible that the Hormuzi influence along the, the Hormuzi presence along the Omani coast through Kalhat will have actually also brought in craftsmen to central Oman. And uh, so we should keep both these options in, in mind. However, after 1252 AD, we have this decorated mihrab, and then there is a hiatus. There is, for 250 years, there's nothing. And then suddenly in 1503, 1505 onwards, we have the 1503 onwards, and this is a particular example for 1505, in central Oman, in a place called Mana, we have a whole series of decorated mihrabs growing up. So we three, it's very quick succession, succession, 1503, 1505, and 1509. We have three mihrabs which are created, which um, happen uh, in very quick succession and followed by a number of others within the next 20 years or so. So within the next, say about, 50 years, we get a spurt of these uh, uh, decorative mihrabs, a lot of those. And I'll come to those ones in a little more detail now. And also the important thing for us, for our particular uh, interest will be that the, uh, the, uh, the ceramic bowl insert that we find here. This is the first time in 1503, we do not see that here, although the decorative scheme has not broadly changed, you know, that and I, I will pick up a little more detail very shortly. The decorative schema has not changed. That is that there are roundels, and then there is a kind of endless knot motif that weaves around the, these roundels. But effectively the schema has been, has remained unchanged or has been picked up from the 1252 AD example to the 1503 and 1505 examples. But the important change that takes place is the insertion of these ceramic bowls. In, in, in the, within the schema. So just looking at those decorative uh, techniques that you, as I was saying, the roundels are there and the roundels are also uh, then uh, circumvented by these, uh, you know, sort of endless knot motifs, which are kind of lines, spiral lines that go right the way around the entire uh, decorative schema and creates an end endless knot motif. Then there are endless knot motifs which are present within the, you know, the smaller decorative elements here as well. But within the roundels, you find the kind of representation starts and so on. And the examples that I show here, the two examples that I show here are from Omani doors, where you find that the kind of motifs that you find in the decorative schema here, uh, endless knots, uh, these kind of uh, roundels, and the various kind of uh, other motives, you know, the mat matted sort of uh, uh, motive, which is clearly coming out of the matting of uh, you know, palm fronds and palm 
matte, matting techniques, which are also used as you can see on the door, but also in the kind of decorative motives here too. So these are consistent. And so therefore there is a kind of transference of decorative techniques from doors to mehrabs and so on, or the other way around too. The other thing that I think uh, one has to uh, talk and think about is the endless knot motive and the kind of the serpent motives are very um, interchangeably used in pre-Islamic uh, Arabian cultures, you know, quite a lot. That happens in South Arabia, in Yemen, but also examples that are found in Oman. For example, these ones are from Salut, uh, which is just from the kind of pre-Islamic time of, um, I would say, around uh, the Sasanian times. Uh, in front of Salut. Uh, these are the kind of examples of, as you can see, the kind of serpent motifs and the roundels kind of developing there too. So there is a link with pre-Islamic um, uh, sort of Catholic worship, subterranean sort of um, uh, goddess, gods and goddesses, which were uh, residing in subterranean cave-like spaces, and they were guarded by serpents. So in a way that this notion of endless knots and the notion of uh, the kind of serpents guarding these territories were kind of uh, interchangeably used. But also the notion of this um, endless knot refers back to ideas of endless time that has been used, endless space uh, that has been used to refer to the desert. And then later on what happens, uh, and a very interesting kind of thing about uh, the, the, these uh, star motives uh, is that they, in the Islamic period, they become, from the pre-Islamic time, they were the moments of excellence and heroic moments that a tribe would remember during periods of strife. So somebody, you know, rising up, creating a kind of, a, you know, a heroic effort to protect the tribe would be a kind of moment that would be remembered amidst the endless expanse of time and continuity of time. Whereas in the Islamic times, one of the important in directions in which Islamic uh, ideas move is to do with the notion of illumination, the twinkle of a star, the understanding of the moment of illumination that actually brings the true knowledge to the believer. So this notion of the star, the representation of stars in the Islamic period also meant reference to the kind of idea of the notion of the star. And what I'll try to show in a moment that these glazed bowls, the ceramic bowls were actually a kind of continuation of that idea that uh, of these kind of uh, the stars motive that we find here. So the decorative motives as I elaborate here, you can see the stars here, you can see the, uh, see the various kinds of other decorative elements which are also derived from uh, the sort of standard uh, uh, geometrical motives, and they have been kind of broken down that way. But, and, you know, in the first 1252 AD uh, example, that we find certain examples where I strongly feel that there are uh, Sasanian Iranian traditions which have been inserted into it, which therefore suggests the kind of possibility of the, uh, the Kalahati, the Hormuzi connection uh, with the Iranian influence coming through that route. And that is one of the reasons why I think there is a strong possibility that it will have come through from the Iranian side of things. And I can so show various uh, examples. This is actually a star motive, which was there in the 1252 AD1 before restoration. And then the, this is following restoration. Now, the, 12, the 1503 example, the first Chinese porcelain insert that we find in Masjid al Ali, you know, which is in, in Mana which has this sort of standard uh, Chinese five crescent bowl inserted into it, a ceramic bowl, which uh, we find it is nothing, you know, not a special item, you know, as such, which was produced um, commercially across uh, uh, the Chinese horizon quite a lot. But nevertheless, it's, it's worth understanding that, you know, why this seems to be a kind of a really important piece here. And this is the 1505 example where I actually pick up uh, a phoenix in flight. And normally the phoenix in flight will always be represented upwards, vertically upwards. And you can also pick up the 
than the situation here that the 5% representation, which should have been vertically up, you know, with the base being here, has been turned around. And I'll come back to that point, you know, in a moment uh, again. But you can see that, you know, at the beginning, there are only, the first example from 1503 has got only one Chinese bowl insert. Later on, we find that it grows in number from say one to three to five, and then to several, you know, including probably about uh, to the maximum of about 17 or so in particular cases uh, at a later time. So there's quite a, you know, sort of ex expansion of this happening. So we did, uh, of course, we um, did some uh, contextual analysis of the crescent um, turned anti-clockwise in this case. Uh, but also from the various sites in uh, the Omani Oasis sites in uh, central Oman, we actually did an analysis of surface finds from the various uh, uh, surface finds in, in those sites of Chinese porcelain. And uh, doing the chemical analysis, which was done, undertaken by uh, a group in Nottingham University, where we found that you know, these uh, were traceable back to three key areas, which are standard production zones, Zingizen, Zhangzhou, and Zehua, where the material came from. So we could find, uh, but these surface finds that we were focusing on, which we could do the chemical analysis of, were also uh, quite possibly, and it looks like that was the case from the analysis that they were the mid 17th century uh, uh, artifacts that were coming into Oman. So what, this is certainly not the first one that we see here. And I'll come in a moment to that one. Uh, the surface finds that we were looking at uh, that grow significantly in the 17th century, that is because of the uh, the Yariba dynasty, which actually came into power in 1625. And they were significantly investing, and this is the first time after a long, long time that Oman again turned itself. Although from the pre-Islamic times, you know, the Sindhabad, the Senna story is connected to Sohar, which is um, uh, in, on the uh, Omani coast, but there were Omanis were from the pre-Islamic times important seafarers. They took part in the what used to be the, called by the Persians the Ard al Hind, you know, the sort of uh, uh, Indian Ocean territory, and they were either working with uh, Iranians, they were working with, with Persians, with uh, Indians, and so on, or working on their own and exporting. And Oman was also a very important copper production area, which produced copper for Mesopotamia and the various other important cultures, Indus Valley civilization and so on at that time. So from there, with this ancient tradition, the seafaring had actually, uh, to an extent, largely gone down, you know, during the kind of, I would say about 12th century till about uh, 16th century. And then it resurfaced again because of the Yarba Imamate investing quite a lot of money and funds towards uh, the, uh, the seafare, seafaring activities. And that happened on the back of getting the Portuguese out of not only Oman, but also from the East African coast. So by going back to the sea again, the Omanis very quickly developed a fleet of both a, a war fleet, but also a maritime uh, trading fleet, which actively engaged with trading. And it also coincided with some the growth in uh, uh, Chinese export at the same time. Uh, so trade with East Africa, trade by proxy with China, trade with India and so on, brought in quite a lot of porcelain uh, at that time. And so therefore, we can explain why in the middle of the 17th century, 1650s, 1660s, we have so much of the surface finds, you know, which are very similar to some of the porcelain bowls being used at that time in the Mehrabs. However, that does not explain 
why in 1503 we have a porcelain insert, a Chinese porcelain insert at that time, because there is no example of uh, ex existing trade, a significant existing trade uh, with uh, China or within in the Indian Ocean cruise. And uh, for that, I think it is important to understand that while major trade around 1503, this is just before the arrival of the Portuguese, the Oman has got a lot of infighting, but at the same time, a number of smaller ports along the uh, Indian Ocean coast in Oman were trading, undertaking smaller uh, Dao trade, both trades with Iran, with East Africa, with India, which were undertaken along the coast rather than along the deep sea. So it is possible that the, um, the Chinese porcelain was being brought in, trickling in, in small amounts through these smaller ports. But also let's not forget what I said before, that Kalhat was still a prominent place. Kalhat was only sacked by the Portuguese in 1507. So Kalhat's prominence allowed certain kinds of Chinese artifacts to come in. And if you look into the, the fact that this was definitely an insert from 1503 and not a later insert could be attested by the fact that uh, the shipwreck, uh, uh, imported shipwreck in 1503, uh, sorry, uh, from 1491, you know, which took place the, around the northern edge of the Philippines coast, carries, you know, this is the, called the Lena Shoal. And the Lena Shoal had uh, very significant examples of the similar kind of shallow bowls, which were present, the chrysanthemum, the five chrysanthemum shallow bowls, which were in the catalog of the Lena, Lena Shoal. And, the same thing also happens with, which I showed you with the Phoenix in flight, which is on 1505. So these kind of uh, material, we, these kind of artifacts were actually trickling into the Western Indian Ocean and trickling into Oman as early as the late 15th century, early 16th century, and becoming precious objects of uh, possession you know, within the Omani cultural context. However, what is interesting is that why did they decide to um, uh, include that? If you remember that uh, I was talking about uh, the, the stars and the kind of prominence of stars as representing illumination, representing the kind of moments of light and the light of knowledge that strikes the, the believer. And if you think about the the kind of glaze, the porcelain, as a kind of a reflective material, it would be appropriate to kind of think that this notion of the light, the illumination, the kind of twinkling of the star and so on, the kind of sudden dazzle would be best presented by the, the porcelain bowl insert. And so the porcelain bowl insert is kind of looking at, you know, really extending this notion of the, the, the star motive more. And that is also supported by the fact that the actual iconography was in a way deflected. Because every time you see these, you see that this particular one has been turned anti-clockwise uh, anti uh, 90 degrees. The Phoenix in flight has been turned anti-clockwise 90 degrees. There are a number of other motives which were destroyed at a later time were also turned anti-clockwise 90 degrees. So therefore deflecting the iconographic content, but highlighting the kind of luster content was quite important. So one part of it is to do with the kind of more theological uh, aspects of, you know, the kind of the quality of the shining quality of the, the bowl. And that was underpinned by the, the growing presence of um, mystical ideas. I wouldn't say Sufi, but mystical ideas in Oman at the same time. And that is borne out by the fact that Later, Omani, uh, Ibadi Omani Imams, who then later migrate to East Africa and set up uh, important theological uh, centers in, along the East African coast, are really important uh, Sufis or important uh, mystics who talk, but also write in a very important mystical way. And those kind of traditions begin to happen in central Oman before they kind of depart 
into Oman, uh, into East Africa. So within the presence of a mystical idea, a pool of idea, this notion of the, the, the illumination takes a particular prominence. Now, I would like to sort of show very quickly the demise of this particular uh, uh, particular uh, trait. So the particular craftsmanship. So it happens from 1252, we have the original decorated mihrab without the Chinese porcelain bowl. Chinese porcelain bowl start uh, happening from 1503 onwards, and that extends to about 1829. Uh, this is a mixture of very poor quality decoration and some poor quality insertions, which are not Chinese porcelain at that time anymore, but copies from different sources from Kerman, from other Indian Ocean uh, territories and so on. And the reason being that the demise of this one is manifold, but one of the factors that I think will be very important to show is that how the particular strand of Sunni Wahhabism began to expand into Oman and very quickly, uh, within a short period of time, actually originating in central uh, Saudi Arabia, it very quickly, through the point of Buremi, which is uh, Alain in UAE, it's a large oasis, uh, broken up between Alain in, uh, in UAE and Buremi in Oman, and through Buremi, they actually make their way down towards uh, the eastern part of uh, Oman. And within a very short period of time, expand their particular brand of uh, uh, strict Islam across this region. So what we have as a result of that is that a number of settlements like say, Salaf and Ibri, you know, which is here. So we have this kind of course the line of the, you know, the Wahhabi extension. And we have very soon, within a very short period of time, settlements like Ibri, like Sinal, becoming, succumbing to the kind of pressures of the, uh, this particular uh, strand of uh, Islam, uh, the Wahhabi Islam. As a result, what we see is that, if you remember that I said the Mehrab in uh, central Oman did not project out. But when you look into the, this particular mosque, which was reformed in Ibri, you know, along the city wall here, you can see it here. Uh, you can see that uh, the mihrab has now taken a projected form and it has got a mimbar as well, very similar to what you'd find in Central Arabian mosques and so on. So the tra transformation of this particular settlement, this particular mosque took place under Wahhabi influence, because the Wahhabis, there's very clear textual information about the Wahhabis being present here for a long time, establishing a base at the top of the hill and exerting influence among the people here. And therefore, you start to see that the changes taking place in the, uh, in the nature of the mosque, which is a very strong kind of significant influence. But also what happens is that very quickly we find that many of these uh, bowls as you can see it from this example in Sinal, that they were actually patched over, they were covered over. They were actually uh, very quickly hidden down and or in certain cases, maybe taken out too, as you can see here. So these changes take place very quickly within a short period of time along the kind of this, so the Southern Desert Edge, you know, around Ibri, Sinal and, you know, down to Bilad Bani Buwali, you know, where some of these kind of changes take place. But also, as you can see, this used to be a pagoda, you know, again, a very, very well-known uh, sort of commercial type of Chinese porcelain, but the pagoda has been scraped out, you know, from the decorative screamer. But let's not forget also that the pagoda has been turned 90 degrees anti-clockwise, you know, uh, in its original insertion in the first place, as you can see here in this decoration. And clearly, the rest of the decorative elements have been completely covered over as you can see here in this particular example from Sinan. So what we find is that this sort of ex extension of the Wahhabi influence, you know, both across the, the land side and also the kind of the coastal side, and that creates the kind of the final death knell for the decorative 
uh, Mihrab tradition in Oman to exist. And uh, therefore, you know, this comes to an end eventually around 1829 or so. So I will stop there. Um, just to summarize that what I talked about is that the Oman, Omani OSS settlements reliant on the Palad system, which is an ancient system that predates, uh, um, uh, goes back to about 1000 BC. I talked about the special, uh, within the OSS settlements, the special uh, nature of the mosques, which are distinctive and possibly relatable to the South Arabian mosque types, but also the type of mosque that uh, uh, with drawing in influences from not only the South Arabian mosque type, but also certain uh, influences that were coming across from the Semitic horizon across the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Then I talked about the decorative mihrab, the special ibadi nature of the mosque and the mihrab, and the first decorated mihrab, which appears in 1252. And from there, there's a hiatus. We have again decorated mihrabs from 1503 onwards, and that's where we see the Chinese porcelain bowl insert. I talked about the kind of the chemical composition, which indicates the kind of the provenance from three particular industrial areas from Southern China. And they come in through various sources. And I also speculate that they, uh, there is a chance that the Hormuzi uh, dynasty and the presence of the Hormuzi dynasty along the coast and the smaller Omani trading centers ports like these ones that we see here, which are small little coves, which create small ports, uh, which are uh, then, you know, they supply uh, material in uh, inland were the kind of kind of key sources to which the Chinese porcelain was brought in, but also crafting was actually moved in to the interior. And I also briefly talk about the demise of that in the 19th century, in the early part of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samyan, uh, for your presentation. It was uh, really a pleasure to hear you. I don't know if anyone has questions. Um, you can write it down on the chat or press the hand button if you have any yeah, questions. I think Pat Patricia has got a question. Oh, okay, Patricia. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, I have some doubts. Um, well, I have a lot of doubts, but it's okay. I'm just going to issue some questions. Um, <clears throat> When you show the Friday mosque, uh, the, the green part, is it plaster or, or is it glazed um, uh, around the, the porcelain bowl? That's a question. And I would like to also um, uh, know if uh, there are more examples of the using of uh, porcelain bowls in other kinds of architecture uh, buildings like palaces or other parts in the mosques besides the mirrors. Um, and uh, if you know any other uh, places uh, where there, there's uh, uh, an equal tradition of using those kind of elements. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's that's very very useful. The green part that I show obviously was not originally green. It was painted green at some point, mm -hmm. and that again would be a reference to some of the kind of other Islamic influences which are coming in at a later time. So this painting that you see, and you will see that you will have noticed that I've also shown a white one you know, which is originally what the form of it was. So the material is gypsum. So it was carved into gypsum. So the decoration was carved into gypsum. And so the gypsum was uh, uh, sort of, you know, sort of the layer of gypsum was uh, applied. And in the very early one, the 15 to 1252 one, where the example is a very formed one, you see that there is a very experienced craft of a network. And therefore the, the crafting has been sort of carved into the soft gypsum, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. from the very beginning. So there is a de decorative schema, which is then craft, you know, carved in, 
okay, with knife carving. Now, if you look into the first example, the white one I showed you, that is a really interesting because the person who starts it, and his name is there in that particular mehrab, uh, one guy called Khomeini, Abdullah al Khomeini, who uh, resided in that particular settlement himself, and then kind of created the school of craftsmen who then, through his family, kind of extended out to the different settlements. Now, if you look into the first one, it is done through a, a cylinder, a sort of rolling cylinder one. So the, he is trying out new methods, you know, with, and very also clearly shows that he's not a mature craftsman by then, at that time, okay? So these are repetitive panels created, precast panels created with a roller and then applied on the wall, mm -hmm. okay? Only the central part is carved out using a knife, okay? So the, the green part, as I say, therefore, is a much later addition, which was kind of, kind of given, you know, the, and uh, as a kind of typical Islamic color uh, indicating a kind of Islamic kind of cohesion, I would say. So, uh, but the technique of that was uh, sort of different. And as you see later on, it be he becomes more and more confident in the 1503, 1505 later on uh, where the carving appears uh, under the soft sort of gypsum and carp, you know, knife carving. Now, the there are only very, very few examples of the use of porcelain in uh, other kinds of buildings, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll explain that a little bit. Uh, this particular set of examples that I'm talking about from the early, very early 16th century is unique and nothing exists at that time uh, in other kinds of buildings. Now, you remember what I was talking about, the Yariba, expansion into East Africa, yeah? And that created a trading community, a kind of prosperous trading community in the Eastern part of Oban, who had a house or they maintained a presence in Oman, but also maintained a presence in uh, uh, Zanzibar and along the East Africa coast, down up to Mombasa and so on. So these people were also trading and bringing in material. So for example, well-crafted, beautifully crafted doors, which were either done in mm -hmm. Gujarat, brought into East Africa, or done in, by Gujarati craftsmen in East Africa, brought into Oman. Now, aside from that, they also, in only one example in Eastern Oman, there is one example of a vaulted ceiling in a house, which has mm -hmm. got these porcelain inserts. Now that has got a very strong precedent in palaces in East Africa, which use the same kind of method. So clearly the influences come from that direction into a later time of civil, uh, uh, domestic architecture, okay? Where there is only one example, only one example. And, you know, and it would be difficult to say there were no other examples because mm -hmm. uh, you know, they may have disappeared like the way that we cannot explain the hiatus between 1252 and 1503. It may be possible that there is uh, there, there were others. However, there are more stronger reasons because a particular regime was at that point uh, stopped and the Ibadi regime came in. And one of the things that they did is to confiscate property and wealth and redistribute to the settlements. So there is a possibility that the redistribution of wealth uh, sort of a state prop money into these settlements, then fuel the, uh, because it exactly coincides with the confiscation of property. So therefore there is a reason for that. However, the, 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 as I say that there is only one example currently that we know of, of that ceiling in a domestic architecture. And there is only one or two small examples in, from, just one, really one or two or three buildings, you know, where maybe at the entrance of a building, there is a top of an arch, there is a porcelain bowl insert, okay? But they are very, very, very rare. So 
I would say that I've seen probably two of those examples and the only one vaulted example, you know, which I, I mentioned. Aside from that, there are around 26 decorated mehrab, out of which about 21 contain uh, the postal limbo incident. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. okay thank you. Um, uh, yes, uh, Eva. The question about now more for the Portuguese specialists. I think all of you were thinking now of the palace uh, uh, where the French embassy is in Santos in Lisboa uh, that has a, a, a ceiling with porcelain. And can you establish any connection to uh, uh, what we heard now? <clears throat> I can talk about ah, good. <laughs> my, my knowledge of the Indian Ocean trade and the Portuguese presence in Oman. I, I know that reasonably well, and I think I can talk about that side of it, and I can, uh, but if anyone wants to talk about the, the particular example from the palace example from Lisboa first, then that would be fine, and I can put my context uh, after that if you want. If I can just give my Indian Ocean context for this, that I have been trying to understand that whether the Portuguese um, presence in Oman had any impact on bringing porcelain into Oman. Now, so far, if we look into the porcelain trade, uh, and I will stand corrected if you know others have any other knowledge of it, that the porcelain trade from uh, through the Malacca Strait along the southern Indian kind of coast then took a, a, a route across the Indian Ocean, the Western Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, and then uh, around the Cape of Good Hope. So it never actually came into the Arabian Peninsula as such. And the kind of letters and uh, which is uh, now the, the I'm not at all, um, you know, in any way eligible, you know, able to read Portuguese, but uh, there is, uh, really an extensive translation undertaken of Portuguese transactions related to Oman and the Indian Ocean uh, by the Ministry of Religious Affairs, which was being done trilingually, Arabic, Portuguese, Arabic, and English. And that's a very, very good record of, you know, how Portuguese trade was operating, you know, in through Muscat and various other um, uh, locations. And there's no mention, while there's a mention, significant mention of other trade, uh, but there's no mention of uh, like peace goods, silk, a range of other trade, but no mention of porcelain at all. So uh, my assumption uh, is that the Portuguese trade uh, in porcelain, which was a lot, but also they lost a lot in the Indian Ocean around circumventing the Cape of Good, Cape of Good Hope, that that went directly into Lisbon markets and bypass the Arabian Peninsula and possibly a significant part of the Eastern African uh, coast as well. Now, I do not think that there is a direct link between that, uh, and I would love to do more work, and frankly, I am not an expert on that one. I would like to look at it uh, after this, uh, that I don't think that the East African example is anyway influenced by or related to the Portuguese example, uh, but I would like to look at it in more detail before I can actually conclusively say anything. And certainly the Omani example seems to be derived from the, uh, the Eastern African example, which was, uh, which clearly preceded the, the Omani example. I would like to, to thank you, Samian, once again for, for your presentation. And uh, thank you all for joining uh, in, once again in Yaslav. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.